Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We go on with our course, quantum transport. Well, uh, the half of the course is already passed by us. Let's do really interesting, practical, fancy things. Um, and this lecture will be devoted by, by to um, homemade quantum mechanics. Uh, it's really enjoyable that by combining Josephson effect and Coulomb blockade, one can uh, make quantum devices, real quantum devices, uh, which uh, to in many extent uh, are similar to atoms, something which houses very much defined uh, quantum states. Right, what do we have to do for this? We need a system and that system we already know. That differs doesn't that doesn't differ much from our um, knowledge. It will be superconducting island connected to superconducting bulk electrode, and we will understand the important thing that superconducting phase and charge are in fact conjugated variables, quantum mechanical conjugated variables, very much like uh, momentum and coordinate are conjugated variables in quantum mechanics of a single particle. Uh, right, we will um, look at something uh, which is specific for superconductivity, uh, the periodicity in phase, which actually leads to charge quantization. We will see it explicitly. Uh, we will consider opposite uh, limits. Uh, some devices could be in uh, the limit of a well-defined charge and the limit of well-defined phase. Uh, we will look, and that would be all about the simple device, uh, superconducting, uh, single superconducting island connected to superconducting electrode. We will look a bit around. First of all, we will get back to single junction and consider microscopic quantum. Tunneling. Then we will look at uh, possibilities to arrange many islands to couple them together, uh, which is commonly called array of Josephson junctions. Uh, and we will talk uh, uh, in this context a bit about lattices. Yeah, but most important topics are there. It's all about single superconducting island, which is also, as we will learn uh, in two lectures, uh, which is also a kind of physical base of uh, modern qubit applications. Right, so we will go on. Let me let us understand why um, we need to combine these two. Uh, we have um, heard about uh, Coulomb blockade and normal metal, and then we will have a, a good property. There are integer states, there are discrete states which differ very well by a classical charge. Unfortunately, as we discussed, uh, there is no quantum coherence between these states. This is because uh, each uh, charge state can be realized with many low energy uh, quantum states. 
uh, and there could be no uh, coherence between the multitude of uh, such states. Uh, what superconductivity does, it does two things. First of all, superconductors, there is supercurrent in superconductors, which implies a possibility to transfer charge from one place to another place coherently, without paying energy for that, without dissipation. Uh, second, superconductors have a gap, uh, which means that there are no uh, low line energy states and uh, each charge state is in fact uh, unique, right? In all metal, uh, one can have uh, one extra electron well, as, uh, and in addition to this one extra electron and an electron hole pair. These states are very low in energy uh, and could they, could they could mix. Well, uh, with superconductivity, uh, extra excitations are suppressed. So it's uh, one of utilizations of remarkable property of superconductivity is the breaking a phase uh, symmetry breaking with respect to gauge symmetry. Um, and the uh, superconductors are used here as uh, the sources of quantum coherence. Right, so uh, with this, if we combine Coulomb blockade, which gives us states, and Josephson junctions, which gives us coherence between these states, well, uh, we, uh, we um, can make it a quantum states superpositions. Yeah, good. One can do it in many ways. Uh, one of the advantages, uh, which is, um, which is uh, currently exploited, is uh, that uh, in this case, the individual quantum state uh, can be made in a device which is uh, which has uh, in atomic units uh, gigantic size, micrometer scale. So in fact, each such device uh, encompasses billions and billions of elementary particles, protons, electrons, whatsoever. Nevertheless, all this large ensemble of particles works in such a way as to produce a single quantum state for us. Uh, and uh, well, uh, what you can do at micrometer scale, uh, it's in fact, um, it's in fact um, homemade, all right? Although, uh, I, I, of course, in order to achieve sufficient accuracy, all these devices are made in um, clean rooms in nanofabrication facilities. But uh, in fact, uh, you could do, you could uh, work at home at micrometer scale, uh, like um, people have fun. They take a uh, rice grain and um, they write, I don't know the whole scripture, uh, the whole scripture uh, 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 at the grain. Uh, in this case, they work at a micrometer scale without any sophisticated equipment. I was curious uh, when I was young how to do this. Um, it appears to be simple. You just need a decent microscope uh, with a magnification of uh, like uh, 100. And uh, you need rice grain, but that's already available. And as as um, a tool to write, you could just use a uh, grain of sand. You can grasp it, not, not, not with a finger, with a grasper, and, and, and write with, a, with this uh, grain of sand. Everything is, wholly, uh, is, uh, is readily available. Sir, this is what we 
can achieve quantum mechanics at micrometer scale or made quantum mechanics. Uh, is my message clear? Are there any questions about this? It's a kind of simple message at the level of, you know, popular literature like Facebook announcement, but it is important to understand it. No, no questions. Oh, that's a bit. Um, shall I pose a question? Ah, all right. It's uh, too early, I guess. Too early in the morning. Right, let me talk about a device, but the system we will um, uh, mostly concentrate on this time. Oh, there's a question. No questions a moment. All right, that, that's what I um, uh, digested. Uh, right. So the system is very similar to what we look at when we study complicate. Fine, there is an island. Uh, where we, yeah, for instance, store charges as we did in complicate. Uh, there is a uh, uh, metal. We take charges from the metal, and there's a gate with which you can uh, buy, uh, buy uh, apply potential with which we can uh, we can uh, change the number of charges. Fine, but for a change we make it superconducting. As far as the gate is concerned, it doesn't matter. It could be superconducting or metallic, doesn't matter because there is no electric contact. There's only electric field from the gate which affects the work of our device. But uh, both metal and islands are superconducting. Uh, fine, uh, le let us recall what we uh, know about the system. Gives us a quantization of charge if we can store uh, charge in this element. We have Coulomb energy. Besides, we know that uh, there is also Josephson energy, which is related to the phase difference. What phase difference in this case? It's a phase difference between two superconductors, superconducting metal, and that phase we could safely put to zero. And uh, there will be phase of the ion. So that can work with a single variable phase. And there is a Josephson energy related to this. And we know that Josephson energy eventually leads to supercurrent derivative of this energy with respect to phase. So there will be also supercurrent. Uh, right. Okay. So we have. Um, let me give now simple explanation, which looks invaluable simple. Why we cannot have um, by um, we cannot have a certain phase and certain charge. Why they have to be conjugated complementary variables as momentum and coordinate in quantum mechanics. Uh, that's simple. If we have certain charge, there is no current 
between uh, superconductors, which means the phase cannot take any certain value. Right? If we fix the phase, there will be current through this junction. And there is no way it can stay in the state with certain end. It looks to be simple to, to it looks too simple to give rise to something um, sensible. Nevertheless, so now I uh, want to do very um, general procedure with this setup. I would like to quantize it. Uh, this procedure can be done in many contexts, many ways. Uh, in advanced quantum mechanics, we quantize, for instance, electric field. Uh, we can quantize many fields, we can quantize anything. Let us quantize um, uh, this uh, system. Uh, island with certain capacitance uh, and uh, just of some energy. All right, what is uh, the general way to quantize anything? It goes in uh, three steps, as far as I'm concerned. Um, first, one should promote classical variables, which are induced to operators. So that is simple to do. Instead of operator, instead of number n, you could write operator. Uh, just write hot above. Well, that does not uh, say anything that it's not in, it is not instructive. In order to make this work, we should understand how apparatus commute. If they don't commute, there's not quantum mechanics that can be also always always treated as uh, uh, classical numbers. Uh, so we need to postulate some commutation relation between the separators, right? And uh, then we need to understand that our postulate, which is rather a hypothesis, really makes sense. How one can check this? One can uh, compare classical equations with system of base. These are uh, quantum equations of motion, which are derived from the Hamiltonian with the help of mutation relations. And if there's correspondence between these two equations, it's okay. All right, general principles of quantization. So now I'm gonna do it for our concrete system. Uh, I don't want to do it in general. I want to restrict the some simple case. And uh, what do I do in this case? First of all, I would like to consider a small phase differences. So I could expand cosine and charge in the Johnson energy and uh, skip this term because it doesn't depend on tension, just constant in the Hamiltonian, right? So I um, end up with quadratic in phi energy, which nicely matches quadratic dependence of uh, the current. So let's be classical Hamiltonian at the moment. And uh, well, we can um, derive uh, equations of motion or uh, how do we do this? Uh, let's do it uh, without invoking any, any complex concepts. Uh, what we have is a current conservation. So derivative of the charge uh, is uh, the current and current is uh, I, uh, under this approximation is proportional to the phase. And that's one equation. Another equation is a Josephson relation, which we have studied. 
it relates uh, time derivative of the phase and the voltage. And finally, a voltage is related to uh, torch by capacitance. Fine, uh, that's, uh, we, we just use common sense a little bit, not knowledge. Uh, we can derive, like, uh, the, the, there are two evolution equations for two variables, uh, phi and q. Um, I will rewrite it in a bit fancy way. I keep equation classical, but I make it quantum in um, in um, the form of notations. Uh, so how do I do this? I substitute here quantized charge. Uh, express critical current in terms of Josephson energy, express capacitance in terms of charging energy. And that's what I get. So just to write these uh, equations in uh, a bit more convenient notation, one can notice a symmetry between these two. Uh, right, so at least it uh, looks pretty. Um, there's a question. Uh, what can we assume that phi is small? Couldn't it just as easy be larger? Uh, we assume it for convenience, so we can uh, make this the whole cycle of calculations uh, in a simple fashion. Uh, one, can, one doesn't have to expand, one can operate with the whole cosine, but then application of commutation relations uh, would be a little bit involved. So I don't want to do this. Uh, but the equations will be the same. Here, if I uh, take the limit of small phi, in fact, it uh, corresponds to an oscillator and we will see it in a second. Uh, so it just, uh, if you wish, this uh, expansion is a pedagogical trick. Uh, fine. Uh, okay. Equations in nice symmetric form. Uh, now let us uh, go on with quantization. Let us postulate that commutator of uh, uh, number of electrons and um, uh, superconducting phase is some operator, and let us assume that this is constant operator, so just a number. That number we don't know yet. So how we can, can get it known? Uh, well, in order to do this, let us um, Remember that we have Hamiltonian uh, somewhere. Yeah, here it is, the Hamiltonian. We have Hamiltonian and uh, right, we can uh, derive Heisenberg equation of motion by commuting both operators with this Hamiltonian. And if you look at it, it is uh, kind of very similar to oscillator Hamiltonian where one of the variables plays uh, the role of coordinate and another one plays the role of momentum. Doesn't really matter which one. Um, and uh, we do this commutation, that's what we got. And now we just need to compare it with uh, classical dynamics. Sir, this. And this, comparing it, we understand that there's no other way this commutator has to be uh, minus two at right. Good, so now we can um, uh, get to the ground which we uh, 
uh, a good thing because we kind of got sufficient experience or supposed to uh, with the quantum mechanics of single particle. Uh, in quantum mechanics of single particle, we have momentum and coordinate and uh, X can be treated uh, as uh, phase and uh, momentum is similar to N. The documentation relation is fine. Uh, good. So if you, for instance, uh, work in, char in um, phase representation, the operator of uh, torch will be uh, like momentum in single particle quantum mechanics. So the derivative with respect to phi. Good. Uh, what is phi in terms of n? Well, uh, one could say it's also, uh, also derivative, but that kind of uh, brings us to um, trivial but very unpleasant mathematical um, things. Uh, I'd better understand it in this way. Uh, let us uh, get to original formulation. Let us uh, recall that we don't have I square, we have cosine. And cosine consists of two exponents, right? And if I uh, look at this exponents in church representation, it is equivalent to shift operator in church space. That's what I right here. So this exponent is an operator and it if it acts on a state uh, is n electrons, it adds, well, basically a good pair, it adds two more electrons to the state, to each state. A conjugated operator exponent uh, minus I phi, it just does the opposite. It shifts uh, everything by minus two, right? Combining this two, this two shifts, uh, you, you don't have anything. So yeah, that responds to the, the product of this operators, operators is one. Good, uh, so uh, we uh, recognize uh, that this exponent and it's uh, kind of very instructive uh, in fact, is a shift of uh, number of electrons. Uh, why does it shift? Why is it shifted? Because a Cooper pair is transferred from the island to the bulk metallic electrode through the Josephson junction. All right. Good. We end up with quantization, so I hope you now convinced that we have realized quantum mechanics. Uh, if you kind of uh, still have doubts, so please, please, please make it sound. Let, let's sort it out. I, I had a question. Uh, in, in quantum mechanics courses, normally uh, we have that um, the position generates the shifts in the in the momentum space, um, and everything is continuous. Here, the, the the shifts that are generated by by the phase operator are discrete. So, why is that the case mathematically? Um, okay, it depends on your quantum book. Um, Usually people consider apparatus uh, like this, where P is a derivative, something like that. Arbitrary number A, operator F, P, unitary transformation. 
And that indeed, if it works in the y function, which is a uh, function of x, it uh, shifts it. I don't remember to which side. Uh, I would say negative. This shift is not quantized, so any parameter in this exponent um, uh, would would do, would provide a shift by uh, some continuous number. Uh, here, we could use an analogy between uh, pi and momentum in coordinate representation, and uh, x uh, becomes n. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get, I get the analogy. Um, yeah, but uh, the there is no continuous uh, parameter here. Yeah, exactly. It has to be always periodic in the phase. Um, good. Uh, then, uh, if there are no further questions, let us make a step forward, and let us. Uh, uh, get Schrodinger equations. We can do it easily because we know how to do this, um, how to get from apparatus to Schrodinger equation in the case of a single particle. And this is very analogous. So we can write these uh, equations in two representations, uh, in any representation, but it's uh, most instructive to write it in two opposite representations. Phase representation. And in this case, the Johnson energy, which depends on phase, plays a role of kinetic energy. Oh, sorry. It plays a role of potential energy. So we have period, a periodic potential, which we have discussed already once in the context of flash force potential. Uh, uh, good, periodic potential in phi. And there's some kinetic energy, which is uh, proportional to charge in energy. Right, second derivative of phi enters here. Besides, we need to incorporate uh, here the dependence on the induced charge, on this extra charge. If you make analogy with the quantum mechanics of single particle, it's like a magnetic field um, affecting the motion of a particle. Uh, but yeah, in our case, it's uh, it's this induced charge. Good, that was phase representation. Let us see what we can do in charge representation. In charge representation, it is. Uh, Charging energy, which is diagonal. Here it is, and scratch. So in phase representation, Johnson energy was diagonal. Uh, in uh, charge representation, charge in energy is diagonal. That's okay. Uh, Josephson energy is uh, produces these terms. Okay, we readily understand these shifts. And yeah, uh, it makes a shrink equation non-local. So um, the, um, not, not only the derivatives of phi enter the equation, but rather shifts of phi at finite distance of uh, Good. So we have the same Schrodinger equation in two, in two uh, equivalent uh, representations. Again, uh, quantum mechanics is science of freedom. We can take any representation which we which we want to solve the problem. But we miss one point, uh, which usually doesn't seem important for students because, uh, yeah. In most cases, for any equation, boundary conditions are not really explained um, because uh, it 
is um, frequently um, obvious from physical point of view and uh, kind of assumed to be known. But mathematicians would say, would tell you, you could not solve an equa equation uh, without without setting uh, boundary conditions. And uh, with, with the same equation, I could think of two uh, two uh, different uh, types of boundary conditions. First of all, I could be could go very simple and say, well, I have periodic potential. So why don't I um, assume that the wave function is also periodic, right? Wave function is periodic. So if I plot uh, this potential from minus pi to pi and the whole interval of periodicity, these points kind of glued together. Wave function is periodic. No, Sasha, I, I, I think you just. Um, uh, <laughs> let me show your previous slide. There was a single exponent. Oh, yeah, that I remember it wrong. Yeah, never mind. Then. Um, okay. Yeah, that's clear. Fine. Two types of boundary conditions. Uh, one could just glue these uh, opposite points and get periodic potential. Um, that's a simple um, representation uh, of this periodicity, uh, perhaps instructive. Um, let's consider gravitational field and let's consider a cylinder. And uh, let's make a cut of the cylinder with a plane which is uh, which is not precisely horizontal uh, well uh, this cut would look like this and if you let the particle move only along this cut that would be precise realization of this cosine potential because yeah uh, gravitational potential is height, we, and this is given in this case by cosine of uh, the angle. Phi is going to be the angle. All uh, right. Uh, good. Uh, then uh, we can just uh, go with boundary conditions like that. But there is an alternative, and this alternative is uh, very much known in. Um, uh, solid state physics, you are given periodic potential, but you recognize that the wave functions doesn't have to be periodic in periodic potential. They could uh, acquire a shift, phase shift uh, upon um, um, translation. Yeah, I'm using already solid state uh, terms. They could require phase shift upon the translation. This shift is related to quasi momentum of the particle. Uh, so it can be like this. So in this case, wave function is defined from minus infinity to plus infinity and doesn't have to be periodic. Two types of boundary conditions. Uh, which one is uh, good? Strangely enough that uh, in this case, uh, the reality doesn't give us a single question. Uh, uh, the reality gives us uh, uh, that both boundary conditions can be applied, but for different systems. As to our uh, Let's say that. Uh, as to our island, 
we know that the charge is one past. Um, to, 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 to see that, uh, to zoom in this um, phenomenon, we don't have to look at adjacent energy at all. So we put just an energy to zero. Then the solutions of string equation will be just plane waves, only kinetic energy. And periodicity condition will impose quantization of uh, quasi momentum for these waves which will become quantization of torch. So in fact, one understands that everything is quantized in such a way. Periodicity from plane waves makes a set of discrete waves and this corresponds to discreteness of charge. But, uh, the charge does have to be discrete if you remove an island the quantization of charge disappears as well so one could just consider uh, a Josephson junction between two leads no island absolutely there's a Josephson junction here there's some capacitance between the leads which also plays a role in quantization, of course. Uh, right, in this case, the torch is continuous. And this, uh, in full analogy, is block states in, um, uh, in uh, solid state physics. Um, quasi momentum of these block states is called, called quasi charge. One can again inherit it from uh, considering um, plane waves without uh, Johnson energy, uh, not imposing uh, the um, periodicity. In this case, uh, all um, possible wave mains can be sorted out according to this uh, phase vector, uh, like in solid state physics. Right, so the charge is continuous, and these two, two different boundary conditions describe, in fact, two different physical systems. Fine, uh, let's see how I'm doing with respect to time. Okay, it's already time for break. So let's have seven minutes break, if you don't mind. We meet at 9.40. Um, Again. And uh, I will stop uh, recording. Very good. Let's go on. on. So we understand that two um, types of boundary conditions uh, describe two physical systems. As far as island is concerned, we can stick to periodic wave function. It's convenient. Um, right, so let us consider as promised two opposite limits, two opposite limits of uh, large charging energy and uh, small charging energy, small in comparison with what? With Josephson energy. And indeed, the Hamiltonian in question, let me quickly sketch it. Uh, it has only two parameters. To compare with. Fine, sure, we consider uh, that uh, the case when charging energy is much smaller, much bigger than Johnson energy. And in main, the picture is uh, very simple and I would say boring. In this case, the uh, levels 
of this commit union are almost pure such states. So N actually becomes quantized. Let me recall uh, the system of parabolas, which we have, um, which we have uh, discussed in the context of Coulomb blockade. Uh, well, uh, at each uh, given discrete n, I have a parabolic curve if I plot energy versus uh, versus external charge. Right, um, so I have periodic, uh, periodically spaced parabolas. To get uh, ground state, I need to connect lowermost pieces of this parabolas. Uh, next uh, state is uh, blue. Next to next is um, green. So that's how it goes. Very well. Uh, uh, however, quantum mechanics still plays the role here. Uh, and a, a convenience uh, of uh, such limit is that it plays a role in very isolated, very simple, very isolated um, a part of parameter space. And um, in a very simple intrinsic uh, configuration. Namely, it, uh, the system becomes um, quantum, so to say, becomes manifest in the quantum only if uh, the energies of two different charged state states are the same as the degeneracy points. So let me get to one of these degeneracy points. There are, some, there are many. Let me get to this one, right? And let me zoom a bit. Uh, uh, here. Without Josephson energy, if I zoom it, I would just get two uh, levels corresponding to two different charge states. These levels uh, would just cross. In quantum mechanics, uh, the level crossings are frequently avoided. What does it mean? It means that at the point of crossing, there is not some non diagonal matrix element between these two levels. And for our case, this uh, non diagonal element is Josephson energy. Indeed, here we have um, uh, two states, zero and two. And Josephson energy just connects the states which differ by a single Cooper pair, fine. And if we take this non-diagonal matrix element into account, the spectrum will split. A small gap will open. The size of this gap will be just proportional to G. Right. If you go away from this point, if you uh, increase or decrease um, uh, this um, external charge, uh, the splitting between the levels become bigger and we have distinguishable charge states. At the mere point of uh, formal degeneracy, these states are just equal weight superpositions of two different charge states. So we have considered the limit, which looked boring from the first side. But if we concentrate on special points and degeneracy points, one gets very kind of clear picture of quantum superpositions with only two states involved, kind of a textbook example, if you wish. OK?
is it clear what is going on here? Shall I write more formulas or remove some formulas, uh, whatever? What can I say to, what, what can I do to, to get this picture more comprehensive for you? I think it's, it's clear. Fine. Uh, let us um, go on. Let's go to opposite limit. Uh, it is, I would say, equally simple, but the reasoning is uh, very different. Just let us um, uh, try to plot the resulting polar spectrum along the same parameter, which is uh, this induced arch. What do we see? First, we have uh, uh, plenty of levels which uh, practically do not depend on this Q. Right. And these levels are almost equidistant. Uh, for lower levels, um, uh, the spacing changes somehow. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, lasts till the energy of these levels will be of the order of Josephson energy. And the typical separation between the levels is in fact much smaller than Josephson energy, and much bigger than charging energy, just geometric mean between these two energies. Square root of the product. Fine. If one goes to um, higher energies, well, one can already see as uh, a sensitivity to to um, induced torch, and that indicates that at, at higher energy, these states are more or less uh, charging states. The parabolas would cross them. Crossings are avoided, but well, we know why, why it exists. Uh, okay, uh, let us understand uh, this picture. Let us understand this picture, and uh, to understand it, let's uh, sketch the potential in phase representation. So there will be potential like this. And uh, we understand. Now that at low energies, uh, one can approximate it with a parabolic potential, as I did in the beginning of the lecture. Parabolic potential gives rise to an oscillator, right? That's why we have uh, a series of equidistant levels over here. Good. Uh, with uh, with, um, with uh, rising energy, The levels won't be equidistant because they feel a more complex potential. It's already deviated from parabola. Still, they don't have any dependence on Q. Why is it so? The dependence on Q can only arise if a particle could somehow uh, reach the top of this potential. and they reappear from the other side. It should go through, make, make a kind of round trip in this potential. This is not possible for wave functions of these levels. Uh, they, uh, they don't have energy to reach the top of the band. However, yet, uh, uh, yet high levels, for instance, here, they are perfectly delocalized. As such, they uh, feel this, um, this, um, this torch, this continuous torch, and they look more like charging states. So charging state, in this case, it's a plane wave. And if the energy of the particle is sufficiently high, 
it just doesn't feel this periodic potential. It uh, propagates as a, as a plane wave. Good. Hope everything is clear. So we uh, are done with superconducting islands. We have considered two opposite uh, limits of uh, small and um, uh, big doses of energy. And we could basically comprehend everything in, uh, in a simple plot. So it is not what, what I've showed to you doesn't look like atomic spectrum. Uh, doesn't look precisely, but in fact, it has all properties of atomic spectrum as far as discrete levels are concerned. So one could do quantum mechanics as one can do with atoms. Also artificial homemade atoms at micrometer scale. Um, Fine. So if there are no questions, let us go on. And let us uh, talk about uh, microscopic uh, quantum tunneling. And uh, let me uh, recall the picture of Rashbord potential. Um, Oh, we had it when we talk about uh, growth interaction, considering it's a classical dynamics. So we um, we uh, understood that growth interaction can be um, kind of seen as a particle moving in periodic potential. Uh, a tilt is the current applied to the junction. So if the current is low, the particle is dropped in this potential wells. Uh, good. Uh, and uh, if it is classical, it just remains trapped. Let us understand what will be quantum mechanical manifestation uh, in this case. Uh, well, it is uh, not uh, complex to comprehend. So if particle is here, of course it cannot does have energy to get uh, to get uh, uh, above to get um, uh, to the top of the potential. Uh, and uh, but for quantum particle, it's not necessary in order to tunnel this barrier. It can tunnel to a neighboring potential minimum uh, and thereby propagate. It can um, lose its energy. And what does it mean? Uh, it will move to the side of uh, lower energy um, and that means that there's a very small voltage at the junction. So any tunneling like this produces a voltage jump at the junction. It can be detected, it can be seen. Uh, right, so that is, um, that got um, a rather fancy title, this phenomenon. This was microscopic quantum tunneling. Right. Microscopic in that context meant that, yeah, that the system under consideration was really big, consisting of billion particles. Nevertheless, it tunnels as a single entity. That was quite the achievement by the time this fundamental experiment has been uh, performed. Right now, we would say homemade instead of microscopic. Uh, right. So there's a fundamental experiment which has been made quite some time ago. 
I don't want to go to the detail, to, to, to details, but just a quantum question to understand that you understand uh, whether you understand correctly how did it evolve, how fast did it go. Uh, let me have, uh, let's have a training on multiple choice question. Uh, when this uh, pioneering experiment has been uh, performed, uh, a 1962 and Josephson that was time of Josephson uh, 2005 somehow closer to modern times or in um, Nineteen eighty-five. Uh, good. Let's vote. Who chooses A? Uh, I didn't give you still a possibility to choose B. Okay, uh, Francesca and Sasha say B. Okay, and that uh, your choice uh, have influenced the choice of others, of course. That's right. You write uh, them. Uh, it, 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 it's been made uh, around this time. Eventually, I don't remember whether it was eighty-five or eighty-two. Uh, oh, I guess eighty-five, uh, but I don't remember for sure. Um, you could just read about this and. Um, Kind of minimize it, but uh, okay, uh, Francesca, can you explain why do you think so? It was a that totally random guess. Right. Totally random guess. Uh, random. Okay. Good. I excluded 1962 because you said it was Josephson uh, period. So yeah. So you just uh, you, you avoid extremes. Yeah, uh, they were randomly or rationally. That's perhaps a good idea. Sasha, would you have more uh, rationali rationalization? Also, affording extremes, but so Josephson just came up with this in 1962, so it can't be that. And I believe we already had. Cooper box uh, quantum dots. So I suppose we already had some idea, and also uh, I believe uh, the what is it? The Shapiro effect it's called uh, was already known by 2005. So the AC, the AC uh, Josephson effect. Um, well, Shapiro is rather, rather about this. Everything has been known by that time. Uh, what uh, was um, uh, challenging in this experiment, um, let me explain because it's not uh, uh, really uh, um, uh, obvious. There is a competitor to quantum tunneling, which is in this case, temperature fluctuations. Uh, sorry, just finite temperature. There can be classical motion of this, um, of this, um, uh, particle um, which would uh, help it to go through the barrier. If uh, you, uh, some of you uh, uh, attend the course of uh, fairy tales, and there was a lecture of Yaroslav Blanter when he um, uh, explained in detail how does it happen in classical physics. Um, because of some of fluctuations. So there must be rather challenging experiments, rather challenging um, uh, measurement to, to be done to distinguish this effect from, one, from some of fluctuations. And that took some time and some experience in fabrications of the junctions. So it could not be done soon, 
it took uh, yeah at least uh, 20 years of uh, technological and experimental development but experiment is very simple in um, in um, uh, kind of uh, in the design uh, one just uh, basically needs on the single Johnson junction uh, so uh, it uh, has happened earlier than uh, uh, fine, uh, let us see uh, how much time do we have to um, talk about the race or eventually plenty of times. Um, so let me first uh, confess that I've been uh, cheating you for a while. Uh, of course, for a good uh, reason, but nevertheless. Um, namely, we always assume that uh, uh, there was an um, even number of electrons in our device. Well, from once, so from on the other hand, this assumption is natural uh, because uh, all the, since we have superconductors and only Cooper pattern series, uh, we can change the uh, charge only by two. But of course, logically speaking, uh, it um, doesn't have to be so. One could also have a uh, charge which is uh, odd from very beginning and then shifted by two. But we have assumed, and I didn't want to explain it in the beginning, that a number of charges in this island was uh, even. Uh, fine. Why is it, sir? What is the explanation for this? The explanation is um, uh, I would say astonishingly simple uh, but also kind of hard to believe. Um, well, sometimes things are so simple that they're hard to believe. Um, let me uh, um, tell about this. Um, well, suppose we have a superconductor, superconducting island, so there is a gap, it contains plenty of electrons, like 10 to the 9, and all of them are in occupied, uh, occupied states, and we uh, just add a single electron. There is no charge in energy, if uh, we have charge in energy, it would just add to it, we just add a single electron. And it will go to an excited state. Good, because yeah, we look at charge is a spectrum of charge excitations. If you add a charge to a superconductor, you have to pay energy delta. Uh, if you add yet another electron, let's put it here. In fact, we don't have to put to, to pay a, 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 a yet another extra because yet another delta because they form Cooper pair and uh, they can be placed at zero energy. So it costs energy to put single electron. It costs no energy to put two electrons into superconductor. So that all states, and here I plotted it as a parabola, all states with even number of electrons will have extra energy, which is precisely delta, the gap in the superconducting state. <coughs> okay, I put it. Um, like this, and it uh, sounds simple, and owing to simplicity, people kind of um, always doubted it for a long time. 
Um, well, because the kind of emotional argument is that you have uh, zillions of particles and uh, it's hard to believe that parity of this number would produce some measurable energy. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it appears to be true. There is parity effect, which has been confirmed experimentally. Good, uh, what does it show? It uh, shows that it's good to have uh, this delta much bigger. Uh, I have Wrong signs here. Uh, let's see how to. It's good to have this delta much because um, uh, you see them. All the states are kind of uh, much uh, higher than the states we we are playing with. Uh, if uh, the situation is opposite. Uh, then it becomes uh, a very inconvenient to operate superconducting devices um, because we cannot uh, really uh, distinguish between uh, states of different parities. And uh, superconductor gives us coherence only by Cooper pair transfer. States of different parities cannot be made coherent. Uh, that's why all uh, nice quantum mechanics, uh, which we um, uh, uh, want to realize in these devices, um, could be gone. We won't know in which states we are. So this is equivalent to decoherence. Uh, fine, so there is a parity effect. Uh, uh, now my uh, conscious uh, is uh, good. I um, confess that I have cheated you and now we understand why. Let's look at uh, more complex systems. Uh, uh, right. Um, I start my outlining with a mathematical formula, and I have a reason to do this, I'm not that I want to scare you. I um, want you to uh, understand that if we have many islands which are close to each other, we can uh, perfectly understand how this works. We can easily understand what would be Hamiltonian of this system. Uh, right. Let's have some islands. Let me just draw it. There will be just some junctions between the, the, the islands. And we know this, uh, the insertion energy, which is brought by the junction. Each insertion junction just brings uh, a cosine term proportional to phase difference, sorry, a containing phase difference between these two islands. Um, junction number K, it has two ends, uh, one and two. Uh, also charging energy, is pretty much determined by capacitive network. Uh, okay, uh, let me draw capacitors between the islands, perhaps to the ground as well. And uh, the charging energy, since uh, there are capacitances between uh, islands, the charges in different uh, islands can interact each other the, with each other, uh, can influence each other energies, right? Uh, this 
is all can be described by inverse capacitance matrix. And there's expression which is uh, which is uh, quadratic in charge. <coughs> Very good. Uh, so uh, I put all these formulas in order to make sure that we understand how the system would work. In a more in a plain uh, language, uh, we can um, think of each. Uh, island as a sort of atom and if we put all these atoms together grouping them uh, we kind of make artificial solid state that was a main catch to make uh, josephson um, josephson uh, um, uh, junction arrays how to make it? It's also very simple, this lithographic techniques. Uh, yeah, you just make a mask with the holes, with many, many holes, and evaporate metals through this uh, mask. And uh, uh, as a result, you could uh, uh, end up with a periodic uh, structure like this. Oh, let us... Um, Let me um, explain what I um, gave in this figure. So islands are eventually this uh, this this point, the nodes of this network. Uh, Joseph junctions are devoted with uh, are denoted with a process. Good. So each uh, island uh, puts two charges. And Josephson uh, junctions, they um, let these charges propagate from I one island to another island. Uh, fine. So if you make such an array, uh, one can um, already from a simple reasoning understand that this artificial solid would exhibit an interesting transition, quantum phase transition, which will occur at vanishing temperature. It's not like other phase transitions which occur at finite temperature. Um, uh, and um, this phase transition uh, should occur by Joseph's energies and uh, charging energies are of the same order. Okay, I uh, I will answer the question of Sasha. Should there be a subscript J on the right part? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you perfectly right, Sasha. I guess it's uh, some old uh, transparency with um, uh, type mode. There has to be index I here. Um, good, uh, summation over I and J. Um, quantum phase transition, um, which is something fancy people have been trying to look at it. Uh, but to understand why this transition should happen, um, one can just use very simple reasoning. Uh, first of all, uh, let us understand that if charging energy dominates and there's no Josephson junctions, um, so big, uh, big um, uh, Josephson energy, the system in terms of solid state is an insulator. Why is it so? Because basically one has to pay charging energy to put any charge to any of these, uh, of these islands. If these uh, charges uh, try to move, basically they always come to the place of a very different energy. Uh, they will repel each other. And uh, that's why it has to be an insulator. Uh, but if you start with large terms of energy, we understand that each uh, each uh, Josephson link is in fact conducting. 
there must be superconductivity, there must be metallic behavior, right? So this is not what can be continuously changed from one to the other. There must be some qualitative change somewhere in between. So we understand that there is, um, there is, um, there must be uh, quantum phase transition happening. Uh, fine, let me tell Let me tell about um, interesting objects which can be um, seen and uh, uh, investigated in its Johnson ways. So here, basically, I draw the same array, but I uh, have um, shown only a single loop of Johnson junction. Um, and uh, in each uh, island, I put an arrow which shows its face. So face is kind of angle of this arrow. And uh, I, all right, which means that uh, somewhere I'm in the limit of large uh, Johnson energy and I am, uh, look at the states with definite mass. All right. What is uh, so interesting in this particular configuration, which is uh, which I've drawn? If I make any loop, except the blue loop in this um, uh, configuration. The change of phases along this loop will be zero. Looks natural. I just add differences. If I if I add all the differences, uh, I would up with zero. But not for this loop. Now we can see that each time the phase is uh, rotated by ninety degrees. I sum up ninety degrees. So I have uh, uh, two pi uh, total uh, total change. All right. So this is uh, special for this particular loop. I could, of course, move the subject to any other loop uh, having the same energy, and uh, I could not. I really uh, remove this property. I could not uh, change the phases continuously in such a way that this two pi would become zero. It always um, always uh, presumes a, a, a jump. So I could not do it continuously, which means that this state is topologically protected. It has a topological charge. Good, let me give a reveal the name of the state is this um, stable configuration of phases is called a vertex uh, and it can be produced by um, another handle one can apply a magnetic field to this array. it will try to rotate the phases in the direction um, perpendicular to this magnetic field so uh, that's a way to produce these particles. Good, this is um, in the limit of large uh, Josephson energy and uh, these configurations are stable. Uh, suppose we add charging energy uh, that will um, make this vortices move like it does for um, in the case of single uh, single island, 
Uh, so it uh, provides a quantum tunneling from one position to another position. So in fact, we have some artificial particles in the solid state, which can be added by uh, addition of magnetic field, which can propagate, can interact, can form some fancy structures. Uh, right, so it um, has been uh, an issue that these particles um, are somehow dual particles to discrete charges, which also can be in the solid. Good, what can I say? Um, it's all about accuracy. Unfortunately, accuracy in um, nanotechnology plays uh, an important um, role. All these fancy things which I told you about have been, uh, was a late, uh, was a concentrated large work to investigate these things. But uh, experiments, experiments have been uh, rather disappointed. Uh, what was the catch? It's uh, easy to make kind of a procedure for producing large dose on arrays at the surface. It is uh, at the moment very difficult. It's not possible to make all these islands and junctions <coughs> to make it all the same. Uh, that's why when we want to make this um, this uh, solid state, what we uh, actually make is very disordered solid state very disordered material, which is not good. Uh, what helps us in a kind of uh, real life and real solid state is all, all atoms by definition are the same. It would be very difficult to modify the atoms to give disorder to the atoms. They can be of different sorts and that would be impurities in the materials and they properties are altered with impurities, your materials are better than pure materials, uh, but that's uh, all for atoms which are basically the same. And with Josephson junctions, which contains from xenons and xenons particles, uh, that cannot be avoided. So the problem of disorder becomes overwhelming so it's very difficult to see something certain in this Johnson arrays because of this intrinsic disorder. Perhaps with the uh, new um, nanotechnologies, one can um, achieve better accuracy and all this fancy physics of Johnson arrays will come, perhaps in your generation, will come back to life. Good, uh, with this, uh, let me conclude this lecture. Uh, we, we talk about, uh, as you might remember, about combination of uh, Josephson effect and Coulomb blockade. We understood that it's uh, basically enough to uh, Make uh, quantum mechanics uh, at your at your at home um, at micrometer scale. We have derived uh, Schrodinger equation for this. We discuss um, the spectrum of the result in Schrodinger equation, and we look a little bit at possibilities of uh, array and microscopic quantum. That was it. So let me uh, conclude the lecture, stop recording, and I'm here for some time uh, for your questions.